Hey guys, I'm so sorry it might be just a little bit loud in here, but um, I just wanted to come on here just to do a quick video on some of the um, intellectual objections against Christianity or just how to answer the Christian faith in a more uh, authentic, not just authentic, but in such a more uh, uh, intellectual way that makes sense to believers, especially because I've been uh, doing some evangelism at my college I go to, San Jose State, so I just wanted to come on here just to present some of just the um, ways to kind of intellectually approach the faith, because um, I feel like at the same time, like, you know, because I was a former, formerly a New Ager coming to Christianity, you know, um, the first church that I went to was really preaching fire and brimstone, which is okay to preach about hell, but like the problem is that um, if you do, I feel like um, there's people who are genuine, but who don't really want to come to that full knowledge of the truth um, immediately. So basically, we have to guide those people with a loving heart so that they do come to the knowledge of the truth. And that was the same for me. I mean, I did have a vision of the gates of hell, as mentioned in Jonah 2.6. But um, the problem was that I didn't know, you know, I really didn't know if it was eternal, if the place was like, you know, because I, I was in a spiritual vision, like, is the place literal? So I just wanted to know that those types of questions and kind of um, get the answer. Why would a loving God create a hell? And, um, and but they, those people at the church that was preaching fire and brimstone couldn't answer that sort of question. So I was very confused for a long time. So I did go in Seventh-day Adventism and more sorts of legalistics and fundamentally wrong type of um, group, Christian groups and um, like ICC's Seventh-day Adventists. But anyways, I could get that story in another time and maybe um, I could answer why does a loving God create a hell maybe at the end of the video. But Or actually, let me just answer it right now. It's because um, of the devil and his angels. Like in the book of Ma Matthew, it says that the um, Jesus says the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So Jesus never intended any human being that he lovingly created to be sent into an eternally burning hell. It was just actually because human beings by their own free will choose to have nothing, choose to have nothing to do with Jesus Christ or anything to do with God. They intentionally reject the simple message of um, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, even after being revealed the knowledge of the truth and being enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they still uh, persistently reject Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says that once he comes back um, to earth in a physical and a spiritual form, once Jesus comes back to earth, um, those who wanted to do nothing to do with him will be sent to a place where they can have nothing to do with him. And that place is called hell. And basically, without God, there's no goodness. Because in James 1, 117, it says that all good things come from God. So that's why hell is such a horrible place, because God has withdrawn all his good attributes from that place. Uh, to those people who don't want anything to do with him. So basically, that's loving, though, because in a sense, like, if you don't want anything to do with Jesus, then you're rejecting everything good that you had in your life, like, because Jesus is goodness. God is goodness itself. And um, and those t that's the character of God, is him being good. But if you want nothing to do with the full goodness of him, then yes, I think a loving thing would be to say, okay, you don't have to do anything to do with me. And I feel like that's sort of natural as human beings. If we have some sort of son or a daughter who's rebelling against us and maybe drinking alcohol or doing drugs or something like that, and they want nothing to do with you, like uh, you will still try to love and reach them and try to um, help them out. But at some point in your lives, like, you know, like you, you'd say, okay, that's it. If you want nothing to do with me, I'll just let you go. You know, and that's the same thing with God, though, because I feel like sometimes letting go is such a loving thing to do. And that's what God does. But in any case, um, I really did want to get into a few questions because or a few of the um, into, <coughs> sorry, intellectual sort of um, questions that you might be asked. Um, and so I feel like one of them is just the basic aspects of the Christian faith, like when we share about Jesus. So basically, Jesus was crucified by the Jewish people. Um, so Jesus was um, was a, is a historically accurate figure, even like even though you're not Christian, um, even like either, of course, there's a lot of um, intellectual Christians, um, people who contend for the Christian faith, but even atheists or 
even Buddhists or even people from Islam or other religions um, or maybe atheism, agnosticism, whatever, those types of philosophers accept, accept Jesus as a historic figure. All religious philosophers accept Jesus as a real historic figure that who lived on the earth. And, um, and the basic things that they agree on is that he lived on this earth. He was a Jewish monotheistic Jew. Um, they do, they, a lot of them by looking um, intensely at historic data cannot refute that he died on the cross. Uh, he died a Roman crucifixion. Um, and the Jewish people hated him because they, he told them the truth. So they agree that his teachings were very hard. And there were many people who were, um, who were with Jesus, but who were, uh, who were vehemently against Jesus's teachings. And there was a Jewish pe person who wrote about Jesus as being a witch or some sort of evil being, because even in the Bible, it says that, um, that some people call Jesus, uh, what was it? Uh, Bezelbub, which is another word for Satan. So um, some religious Jews thought that Jesus was Satan, but that was because of his hard teachings. And lots of historic figures accept that Jesus was a very controversial figure um, in the first century. And even um, I attended a um, Bible studies class at San Jose State, and this was led by a religious studies professor who wasn't any um, who wasn't involved in Christianity? He even said that um, he even said that being involved in any religion is bad, but studying religion is a good thing. And he said that that's sort of the place where he draws the line: is studying religion is okay, but not becoming involved in any religion. So he was that type of person. But anyways, um, he said that he said that yes, most people agree that Jesus was actually a historic figure, and. Um, and yeah, and his crucifixion was actually real. Like, there's no dispute about the controversy he caused and some of the arguments that he caused during that time and um, while he was living. So in any case, um, that's sort of the thing, though. The resurrection, though, also resurrection is recorded, although not recorded historically, right? In the Bible, it says over 5,000 people witnessed it. But what is historical is that after his resurrection, um, there were a group of Christians, right? And some people might argue that, hey, like, you know, those Christians just wanted to promote their own agenda of Jesus rising from the grave. But unfortunately, those people went through heavy Roman persecution, um, heavy Roman persecution during the first century. And, um, and that was because, um, because of their hard teachings about heaven and hell and how all mankind is sinful and in need of a savior. And so basically that's what they contended for, was that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And because of that, um, historians, well, historians agree on this fact, that Christians were heavily persecuted. And some were even thrown into lion's den to be eaten alive by lions or to be burned at the stake. Um, that was during, and even when John wrote um, the book of Revelation during the um, 90 AD, so 90, days after, 90 years after Jesus was crucified, um, 60 years after Jesus was crucified, right? Heavy, intense Roman persecution started. And this is also what the um, biblical studies professor acknowledged, was that lots of Christians, um, when the book of Revelation was written, um, when John was writing the book of Revelation in the island of Patmos, um, Christians were heavily persecuted, thrown into arenas where there were lions and eaten alive. And that's, that's not a, just acknowledged by me or by any other Christian. Um, the person who I to told you about earlier in the video, who is a, S a San Jose State professor, a Bible studies professor, who isn't involved in the Christian faith, also says that after doing his own research, that actually like Christians were heavily persecuted during the first century, right? And um, they went through horrible things like death, um, hunger, starvation, you name it, all the physical um, problems that they had. They weren't rich. They were oftentimes very poor. They were thrown into lion's den, eaten alive, heavily persecuted. That's what even a person who's not, who is non-Christian would say. So I would say this, like if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, why would over millions of Christians over the span of, let's say uh, like 300 years or so until uh, Christianity became a state religion under Constantine? Of course, the um, whether or not Constantine was actually, actually, um, actually 
a genuine Christian is much up to, much there's much historic debate about that but in any case for 3,000 years in the Roman Empire Christianity or Christians were persecuted both Jews and and um, Greek or um, what, what's the word Gentile Christians were persecuted for their faith why would there be over a 200 year period or even more because even after Christianity became a state religion Christians kept on being persecuted um, and, you know, Martin Luther in the 1500s was persecuted for believing the Christian faith and the fundamentals of being saved by saved from hell by grace, grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ. So he contended that it's only by believing in Jesus that we're saved from hell. And so why? So right. So anyways, he was persecuted for that, too, in the 1500s and so on. And even today, there's Christians, too. So why would there over 2000 years be so many Christians like persecuted for the belief in Jesus Christ, right? Why would they want to have that life of suffering? Was because they know that Jesus is real and Jesus did indeed rise from the grave. And, the, and his promise of rising from the grave, the Holy Spirit comes into us because he rose from the grave. And that's my conviction and that's other uh, Christians' uh, conviction. But yes, but even under that heavy persecution under the Roman Empire, Christianity survived. Why? Well, duh, because it's real. I mean, if you you won't really die for something that's fake, right? So that's some some intellectual argument right there. Um, also, some something that um, is really key to key to know is the doctrine of the Trinity. So it, so God is there's only one God, right? Um, I like how Nabil Qureshi he was a former a person who was formerly uh, into Islam who converted to Christianity. And what he has to say is very interesting. I like his explanation of the Trinity because it's the simplest and it's the fastest way to explain it. So, for example, I'm Tatsuya, right? And I'm a human being. And I have a friend, uh, let's say Bob. Like, I'll just say that I have a friend, Bob. We're both human beings. But, for example, like, Bob is my boss, right? So he has higher authority over me, right? And that's kind of the same way with the Trinity. You see, tr the Trinity is three persons, right? But those three persons are God. They're, so their being is a God, right? But, but you see, but God the Father has more authority over Jesus right now. Well, actually, in the book of after he was uh, crucified and suffered for mankind's sin and rose again, um, the Father, God the Father bestowed all authority on Jesus. But in any case, that's why, um, so God, there's God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And they, they have existed throughout eternity. So basically, the concept of time is basically um, just a reality in this life, in the, in the physical life that we have now, or in the span of Earth's history. But God has existed before, way before Earth's history, forever before Earth's history, and forever after Earth's history, right? So we need to get that concept that God is eternal. The creator God is eternal, right? The God who created man. And then, so basically the Trinity, right? So we need to understand that God is triune. Um, and basically, we need to understand that Jesus was conceived by the Virgin Mary after she had the miraculous encounter with the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't through um, two, a man and woman, a human being or a human, bi human biological woman and a biological man having intercourse with each other that Jesus was conceived in the mother's womb. No, it was the Holy Spirit fell on Mary and basically Jesus was conceived in the wound. And so that's that's something that we have to make sure that we understand when we get into some of the intellectual debates, or not just intellectual debates, but some of the intellectual interactions that we have with other people, especially, you know, at universities or um, students who are very curious about the faith. Um, and also we need to know the accurate account of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So he was rejected by his own Jewish people. Um, and at that time, um, Israel was under Roman control and um, the Roman Empire was controlling that area. And specifically, the Roman um, governor who was controlling that sort of area of the Roman Empire, his name was Pontius Pilate. And so we need to understand that because Pontius Pilate allowed Jesus to be crucified because he, he asked Jesus, what is the truth? And Jesus is the truth, right? But he never answered because he Jesus voluntarily wanted to be crucified to take away the sins of mankind voluntarily wanted to suffer um, and drink God's cup of wrath 
for um for the to take on the wrath that mankind deserved for their sins. He drank that cup, right? But anyways, Pontius Pilate was the one who was responsible for, indeed responsible for allowing Jesus to be crucified on the cross. And there's such a um, beautiful account in the Bible that says that Pontius Pilate's wife had a vision about about this Jesus, and she, she immediately got convicted with that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, and oh, and that's also really, really important, because Jesus is not half man, half God. He's fully God and fully man, 100% God and 100% man, but anyways, Pontius Pilate's wife uh, knew who Jesus really was, 100% man, 100% God, and she knew the consequences of crucifying Jesus and God's judgment if, if Pontius Pilate allowed um, allowed the Jews and the Romans to do that. Um, so sh she tried to convince Pontius Pilate not to crucify Jesus, but Pontius Pilate was a people pleaser, so he just allowed the Jewish crowd, the Roman and Jewish Roman crowds to, or sorry, the Jewish crowd to just allow Jesus to be crucified. And the Jewish people turned on Jesus. And um, another very intellectual questions that, that I get is, how does God reach the unlost people? You know, the unreached people, because um, I was talking to this Indian guy, and he's like, in my Indian village, there's not many people who know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And throughout history, there's only been a few people who have heard the gospel. Yes, that's right. But at the same time, I need to say this. Isaiah, even before Jesus came into this world and took the form of a human being, was conceived by the Virgin Mary, had a vision about Jesus, right? If we read Isaiah 53, so as King David, David was before Jesus came into the world and took the sins of mankind. and He had a vision of God. So and it also it says in Acts 2 that young men shall see dreams and old, old men shall prophesy. Young men shall see dreams and visions. Right. And so basically um, the thing is that um, God chooses to use people like me or you human beings to spread his gospel and to tell people about the truth of Jesus Christ. But he can also, if he, no, there's no human beings, he could also sovereignly move and give visions and dreams about himself to people. If they're just, if they show a tiny ounce of humility and say, God, is there really a God and kind of question that um, and open their hearts or even just open their hearts, God would sovereignly give them dreams and visions or use other sort of forms of media to, or other sort of means means or modalities to communicate his himself and what he did and his gospel and his truth about his son Jesus Christ. Um, and that's kind of my testimony to coming out of the New Age movement, because I actually didn't trust in the Bible or anything like that, but God sovereignly showed himself, uh, showed me a vision of the gates of hell or the gates of Hades, as mentioned in Jonah 2, 6. And there's also other verses like um, the Jesus says that he has the key to Hades. Um, that's also another verse that shows that, or the gates, the keys to the gates of Hades. That's also another verse that Jesus talks about um, where he directly mentions the gates of hell to Peter the apostle or one of his his main disciples, Peter. But in any case, um, Jesus showed me about that and he convicted me like he did with Doreen Virtue and many other New Agers, like even Stephen Bancars. He showed himself to them and he showed them that the Bible is indeed the word of God and should be taken literally as inerrant and infallible. And that's sort of the visions that he'll, he will give to the unreached people too. Or even, even so, he'll just show them that mankind is sinful and if anybody believes in him, they could be saved and they could be born again in their spirit body. And so God will just sovereignly give visions and dreams. And the next question is also very interesting. So how is, um, how is it that there's many faiths? So how is it, is, is it that there's like many different types of religion, including New Age, atheism, agnosticism, um, let me name a few, like Islam, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, um, and so forth, and Hinduism, to name a few. But I'd have to answer this, and this is what Ravi Zacharias have said, has said, and this is very true. If you investigate all religions thoroughly, um, just by looking at their facts, so if you go to religiousfacts.com, um, actually, they don't promote any sort of religion. They just show you the facts about every religion. Um, and there's also religioustolerance.org, which I really like. They're not, they don't have any sort of like bias because they don't contend or um, stick to a certain faith per se, which is really good. Um, but they kind of just show you 
the outlines of like every sort of religion out there in the world. And by the way, guys, even like religious plural, pluralism is actually a religion itself too, because they just take many different aspects of many different religions and try to make it their own faith. So as the Baha'i religion, um, they, they believe that God, um, there's new re revelations of God in each religion. Um, but that's not true. But anyways, they sort of create a faith of um, borrowing from different religions and making it their own. So they're also a different faith. And so that's something that you could argue that um, that all faiths are very different, even the ones that try to per say that all religions are the same, which is completely false because every religion is fundamentally different from each other. Even the religious pluralist, um, they, they, they have their own religion too. So every religion is fundamentally different. But most religions are fundamentally the same in one way, is that they require works to get you somewhere. For example, in Buddhism, works to get to a state of enlightenment, a state of enlightenment, that's their goal. Or even in Islam and Judaism, where you have to work your way to salvation. But in other, <coughs> in any case, um, in Buddhism, like, there is no, Buddhists, um, all Buddhists, starting from uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha who uh, meditated and found enlightenment, so-called enlightenment, um, he contended that, um, well, he didn't blatantly deny that there was a God, but he did, um, in some writings, he actually did, um, was vehemently opposed to, um, to there being a personal creator, God, like in the Bible, you know, like a personal God who has his own traits and moral standards. And, and he created mankind and everything in the universe and on this earth. He t completely rejected that idea. And so as um, all, mostly all modern Buddhist sects deny and deny and oppose the idea, the very, very idea or the very, very truth that God, there is a personal God who created mankind or there is a personal God who created the universe and everything like that. They deny a creator God. That's very true. The God who's created the universe and everything in it and who's above and much stronger than the, the things he created, like the universe and anything like that. All Buddhists, um, most, uh, mostly all modern Buddhist sects, completely reject that. And yes, I have med, read many Buddhist texts, but the gods they do believe in, if there is a, they, they do believe in a God, is more of an impersonal God, um, like the one in Hinduism. They believe in polytheism, or pantheism, which says that everything is God, like me, you, um, the door is God, the sea wing is God, the lights up here is God, the tree is God, the rock is God. So they believe everything is God because they believe God is an impersonal force. It has no moral standards. He has nothing. Um, that's what they believe in because they're pantheistic. Or they could believe in panantheism too, which is also another form of pantheism. But in any, in any case, um, that's sort of the things that they do believe in. And Islam... And so I'm just kind of showing, that's why I said, because I just want to show you how religions are fundamentally different. Islam does believe in a creator God who has a ha heaven and a hell, but they have no savior like Jesus. Well, they do believe in a Jesus, but he's only a prophet. He was never crucified. It's blasphemous. And Islamists deny that Jesus was actually crucified they, because they just believe he was a prophet. And so they don't believe he's 100% God, 100% man. He, they just believe he was a man. Um... And of course, Islam, like in its fundamental teachings of Muhammad, can get very violent um, if you radically interpret and accept um, the words of Muhammad, the prophet. You could get radically violent and and stuff like that. So it, it's really dark what he did, like physically violent and everything like that. Of course, we as Christians fight in the spirit realm, right? And I've m mentioned that in my previous videos, but that's sort of the thing that. Um, that happens when we take that. And also, Islam do, has no savior. Um, God does not... So like in Islam, God does not bear the sins of... So there is no God who comes in the form of a human beings and takes on the sin of mankind. So we're left in our corrupt and evil state. And so that's another problem that we have right there. Um, and so basically, yes. So basically, I just kind of mentioned that. Um, and then... Oh, and just also to add, the, add quickly on why how to show that religions are just fundamentally different is that in Buddhism, they don't believe that there is a heaven and hell. They're, they believe that um, you have to read, reach a state of enlightenment. By, and they also don't believe in any creator. Most Buddhists, like modern Buddhists, or even Buddha himself, didn't 
well, Buddha didn't really refute whether or not there was a God, but in most cases, most modern sects of Buddhism or most sects of Buddhism believe that um, there is no creator God or a personal God who created the universe and everything in it, every human being, every animal and every there's water and everything in the universe. And he's a creator God who has more authority and power over the universe, created the universe itself. They don't believe in any any of that. So um, that's a difference. Also in Islam, um, there is no personal savior, even though they believe in a heaven and a hell. They don't believe that. Um, there was a person, a God who took on the form of a human being and died for their sins. And their Jesus is only a prophet who is not really the one in the Christian faith. So I just wanted to make that clear. <clears throat> also in um, New Age and other religions, there is no, um, like in Buddhism or in the traditional five religions like Islam, Judaism, Christianity, there is no moral boundaries. So basically you could create whatever realm or spirit you want. But in any case, they reject, um, they reject philosophies from other religions itself. But they incorporate all this stuff from the faiths and from the, the so-called good stuffs of other faiths and try to come to make that their own sort of religion. And that's and they use sort of spirituality and stuff like that um, to create their own religion. So that's kind of how they are. And some people do believe in an impersonal God, not a personal God, but an impersonal God who's like in you or who's in me. Or it's kind of like pantheism because um, pan or panantheism who believes that. This wall is a God, I am God, the tree is God, everything is God, and God is just only a force. And so God does not have this moral standard of between right and wrong, and he can't interact with you personally, anything like that, because he's impersonal. So that's another difference like um, in religion, in the New Age religion, compared to other different types of religion. So I wanted to show that that's fundamentally the same and different. But I also want to add that all of these different sorts of religions all have this one thing in common, except Christianity, is that you have to work your way towards achieving a certain goal. But in the Christian faith, we already have attained the goal because if we believe in Jesus, because Jesus won the victory on Calvary and he rose again on the third day. And because of that, the Christian faith stands on the resurrection, on the victory of Jesus Christ. So basically, the only work in Christianity compared to other religions who require multiple works, the only work of, that God requires man to do is to believe that his son suffered for mankind's wrongdoings. His son, Jesus Christ, suffered and died a horrific and horrible death both physically and spiritually on the cross to take on the wrongs that we as human beings have done because all human beings have done something wrong at one point in their life so the only work that god requires is to believe in jesus christ and his work for taking away the sins of mankind that's what god that's the only work that god requires and that's what the christian faith says in every work that we do we do like every other work that we do, like witnessing for the faith or living a pure and holy life, um, we we can just do that naturally because we believed in that sort of thing. We believed in Jesus and what he did sincerely. So we're just naturally able to do that. And also because we believe in that sincerely, we have the Holy Spirit has come into us. And so everything that's done is not by me. It's by Jesus living inside of me. The Holy Spirit will naturally start doing the works that he wants me to do. And so basically that's how it is in the Christian faith. And that's unlike any other religion. And then um, I guess some of the last few questions that um, are typically common um, is about evolution, right? So um, in any case, um, so there's um, evolution, right? So there's the difference between, um, there's different difference between macroevolution and microevolution. So um, in, so basically, um, in, in macro evolution uh, contends that, you know, like species will sort of because um, of sort of environmental challenges or um, competition that species can start to evolve slowly. Like, for example, um, like, you know, like there, there if there were bugs and during the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of smoke. Right. So so these white bugs became camouflage. They eventually turned turned their sort of like wings to become black, like the smoke and fog so that they could um they could hibernate or like they could camouflage better right so that's sort of a good evolution right that can happen but um macro evolution cannot happen because it's kind of like a single cell organism over billions of years become a human being but that's completely false and you don't even need a science degree to argue that um so that's sort of the thing though and also um i just learned from um um 
I think got or Genesis.org or answers in Genesis, like from these scientists that basically um, um, living organisms lose genetic information during their lifetime. So basically when they reproduce, they cannot create another organism because in order to create a frog into into let's say like a lizard or something you need more genetic information to turn a frog into a lizard and stuff like that but even if the person does believe in evolution and contend strongly with evolution you could say this um so basically a single cell organism by random chance can evolve into a man right so who was behind that evolution of course that has to be god because like why why would we randomly evolve into a human being with intellectual thoughts and with thoughts of like why are we the most intelligent species why would god uh, evolve in that sort of fashion right so we could argue theistic evolution too which is also really great but also theistic evolution has its of course downsides because god says says that he created okay sorry it's getting loud but god said that he was he uh, created mankind in um in six literal days and also it says that Jesus says that since the creation, uh, God created man, male and female, or God created mankind to be male and female. So that's also another very, um, very contradictory thing that can happen if we believe, uh, believe in uh, theistic evolution. But in any, and that could damage our theology because it says that um, death came in through sin after Adam and Eve bit out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, so if, if we do believe in theistic evolution, we have to believe that organisms died physically and um, came back to life physically um, before Adam and Eve. Um, if, but that's not, that's not true at all because physical and spiritual death only came through Adam and Eve biting out of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And before that, there was no spiritual or physical death. So animals couldn't <coughs> have evolved before Adam and Eve. So theistic evolution might... Um, destroy that sort of theology that sin sin is serious and causes death um, both physical and spiritual death um, can be an argument against theistic evolution so I would be careful with using arguments from theistic evolution um, but in, in any case um, that's sort of the end of my video right here um, if you guys have any um, more new information about some of the intellectual questions that you come across while evangelizing, please contact me or leave a comment down in this video so that I could start to investigate that because I'm pretty sure that as I start to evangelize to many people and talk to people about the simple faith in Jesus Christ as an evangelist for him, um, I would be, I would have to have a reason for answering my faith. And I just want to end by reading, uh, I think it was 1 Peter 3.15. So let me just go there really quickly. Peter 3.15. 15. Let me just go there. Um, 3.15, right. Um, or actually, I think it was First Peter 3.16, which says, um, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Wait. Okay. Oh, yes. So First Peter 3.15, it says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear so we always have to be able to answer some of the intellectual and harder questions we always have to be ready for that and we always have to have a good reason for that because that would help people come to the true faith in jesus christ and will stir up some people's intellectual curiosity to investigate the philosophy of christianity itself so that they could be led to Christ. But in any case, guys, even and even though they contend for their whole lives um, about the philosophy and about the legitimacy of Jesus Christ, even though they might do that, they still, because I've spoken Jesus and spoken the Christian faith into them, at the end of their lives, they might accept Jesus Christ and then go to heaven. So you never know. So always be, so you see the intellectual arguments, we don't want to be too intellectual that we deny God, but I, no, there is no way to be too intellectual. But in any case, we have to have those intellectual arguments to the opposing reasons of the Christian faith so that we could show that the Christian faith is rational. Actually, C.S. Lewis said that um, that cr the Christian faith is can be argued intellectually 80%. So it's 80% logic and 20% revelation. So we have to make sure that we have that 80% um, 
with us. You know what I mean? Because the Christian faith can be argued logically 80%. And that's what, according to C.S. Lewis, and he was a agnostic, I think he was an agnostic or atheistic professor who contended against the Christian faith for so long. But he but once he investigated Christianity uh, logically, historically, scientifically, in every sort of aspect um, as a professor um, and investigated many different types of like liter literature in Greek philosophy, stuff like that, um, and all the famous philosophers of his time, he came to faith in Jesus Christ because it was the most, um, because it explained um, origin, purpose, morality, and destiny. It answered those four questions in those four realms. And he was really convinced about that after investigating so much of everything else. He, he really, really, really opposed it. Yet he came to the faith through the intellectual reasons. And so, so from him, I, from C.S. Lewis, a really smart and intellectual guy, I say this, and um, who's really investigated the facts really thoroughly. So um, in any case, we have to make sure that we have a good answer to everybody. 80% logic in arguments, intellectual, but 20% revelation through the spirit and everything like that. So thanks guys for listening to this video. Um, and also, yeah, leave some of the objections of Christianity down below, um, down below. If there's any sort of like intellectual sort of questions or intellectual ob objections against the Christian faith, I'd love to hear them in the comments. Um, and I'd love to lead you to a lot of good resources too, like Ravi Zacharias Ministries and a lot of great Christian apologetics um, because I have a playlist of that and I know lots of Christian apologetics um, websites and I've done some research myself and I know a lot of Christian intellectual Christians who would love to um, who have loved to share with me some books interesting books and interesting apologetics material for the Christian faith so um, if anybody has any questions please leave a comment down below because I'd be happy to answer them or I'd be happy to figure them out with you guys thank you so much